So, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, hello and welcome, especially to uh, folks who are new here. Um, this is Code Soul. We do IT education in the Soul community uh, along a variety of topics. Uh, we've been around for six years, and we're just trying to build a community of IT liking people. So um, we do have events like this every week. So be sure to uh, watch us on Meetup and uh, join our Discord as well. Um, today we have Caitlin, uh, who will present on the top on the uh, basics of web application security. And uh, with that, I'll let her introduce herself. And uh, thank you for coming. Okay, I should start my slideshow. Hello, uh, my name is Caitlin, Caitlin Montgomery. I am originally from the Bay Area, San Francisco, California. I moved to Korea in September. I uh, have worked in cybersecurity for about three years now. It's a field that I'm very passionate about and I'm actually looking to make a career change into software development. Um, I, as I said, I'm very passionate about software security and um, DevSecOps. Uh, my favorite type of vulnerability is um, supply um, chain software vulnerabilities. If you don't know what that is, um, I will go a little bit more into um, into it later on. And uh, I am open to employment if anyone here is looking to hire. <laughs> <laughs> so this is some um, basic vocabulary for uh, those who are new to cybersecurity. Uh, a vulnerability, basically, it's a code. Uh, it's a flaw in co code or design that can create like a potential point of weakness for uh, compromise. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it's a nonprofit, and I think there are chapters all around the world. I don't, I don't think there's one in Seoul though, but there is one in like my um, the Bay Area. Really great um, stuff. Um, DevSecOps is, you know, development, security, and operations. It's basically a practice of integrating security into all stages of the software development life cycle. What is application security? It, uh, application security, it's also known as AppSec. It can be described as a subfield of cybersecurity that pertains to software security. It's a set of practices that ensures security at all stages of the software development life cycle. More often than not, um, AppSec teams collaborate with other departments like engineering, um, QA, and, and ops like um, SRE, um, site rel reliable, oh, I can't, <laughs> cannot say, what? Reliability. Yes, site reliable engineering, yes. Why is AppSec important? As uh, modern software grows and more uh, grows more complex, um, so does the attack surface. Uh, so supply chain security, it's important when dealing with code bases that have uh, contain multiple third party libraries. Uh, OWASP top 10, it lists uh, the most common web application security vulnerabilities. And there's actually other like there's a, a WASP top 10 for web application security, and there's also like a WASP top 10 for mobile security and also uh, API security. So it's a pretty big field. And uh, ultimately, uh, AppSec is important because it's more cost efficient in the long run to priori prioritize security in the early stages of the software development life cycle. So um, for example, there are bug mounty platforms I uh, have managed um, a platform in the past, and something that is like a high vulnerability, high critical vulnerability, um, something that can cost your company like thousands of dollars to just to pay out for that bounty. But um, bounties, I would say bug bounties, they're actually um, probably like a drop in the bucket compared to like what an actual breach can cost, so, yes. You can take off your mask if you want. Oh. Or not. Well, I, I didn't, but the previous speaker did it, so. Oh, I, uh, yeah, well, I, I guess I can, but. It's your call, don't worry about it. Okay, no that's cool. So, I was top 10. 
um, kind of explained this a little bit in previous slides, but um, this is like the top 10 most common vulnerabilities in web location applications. Um, it includes um, SQL injection, uh, cross-state scripting, which is often abbreviated as XSS, and um, cross-site request forgery, which is, you know, abbreviated as XSRF, and more. So there's actually some stuff on the OWASP top 10 that isn't technically like related to code. It's stuff like um, uh, misconfigured, misconfigurations, um, stuff like you know, um, what is it called? Like default passwords and default credentials. Yeah, fun stuff. And as I said, there's like different lists for mobile app, and app security and API security, but more often than not, the, uh, the same types of vulnerabilities are you know, found. And this is more vocabulary that um, is important to know once uh, we've covered like all the other AppSec basics. Um, CVE is common vulnerabilities and exposures. It's um, a it's not a list. It's actually a, a database of every um, every vulnerability that's like ever been like reported. It's uh, really fun stuff. I really enjoy like just digging through all of it. Um, the CVS S uh, common vulnerability scoring system. It's a way that vulnerabilities can be rated. They are usually rated from 0.0, .0 which is, you know, low to 10.0, which is it's considered critical and um it's if you are working for a company and you have um a vulnerability that's reported and it's um it's, oh, not like 10 but close to 10 upwards of like I think the it's usually eight and above. Um, it's kind of like an all hands on deck situation and um, it needs to be patched immediately. And a zero day, um, some people call it O day, but I call it zero day. Um, it's a vulnerability that is discovered by um, attackers or in some cases security researchers before a, the vendor becomes aware of it and can issue a patch. I think one of the most recent examples of a zero day is um, the log4j which happened in like two years ago yeah yeah, that was, that was scary. <laughs> yeah. what yeah that it was pretty big um so the thing about zero days is that um there are like you know bad actors like nation state actors that will use that opportunity to um exploit and do not so good things. Okay, does anyone have any questions? What's, what's the name of the team that you said that, that uh, does this, like a CSS team, I can't remember. The, the team the, that interfaces uh, with the other teams that the team that uh, for uh, it's called application security. Yeah, did you work on a team like that before? Yes, I have. Um, I have like about three years of a cybersecurity experience. In my last role, I did primarily application security. Okay. Is that usually like a separate team, or like it? It really depends on the company. Um, uh, if uh, you work for like a large tech company, that's. I want to say like. Since my uh, experience is primarily in the United States, like large tech companies, they more often than not have the funding to do mm -hmm. have separate teams for product security or application security. But like, um, I would say like smaller companies, they, it is usually part of a security team. Okay. In, in the kind of stuff I work on, it seems to usually fall to developers to, dig, to know about that stuff. I mean, they don't have like a separate team to interface with. So. Yeah, uh, there is uh, a concept um, called uh, security champion. Um, it's, and I think there's also like the Netflix partnership model, um, where every development team has at least one security-minded person on the team. But more often than not, that's impractical, just because. Um, just, I want to say it's impractical because. 
there's just not that many like security people and if there are and if a company does have security people it's more likely than not they're going to be focused on like infrastructure security and corporate security rather than you know if that makes sense yes very very true um, I recently learned about that um, that quarantine app or that self isolation app like oh, two years ago. Yeah. Did you read about the recent the security researcher who published kind of an expose on all the Korean security software? It's I, I did not. Oh, it, it only came out like a week ago. I, I think I may have read that. Yeah, it's it's pretty accurate, but. And then um, these are some additional resources uh, at wasp.org. It's um, if you get a membership, it's fifty dollars a year, and twenty dollars for students. It includes um, access to learning labs um, and learning resources, and there's probably some other stuff. I think you get your own wasp.org email, which is pretty nice. Uh, we hack purple. Um, it's by Tanya Jenka. Um, she is really good. She has a book called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. Um, I was gonna bring it with me today, but I forgot to bring it. And sorry about that, but it's a really good book. It's super thorough. I have enjoyed reading it so much. And um, No Search Press, they are actually, um, they publish books. And a lot of those books are to do with um, IT security, um, various programming languages, and it's, it's really good stuff. Um, so. <sighs> this is my contact information. I'm on Discord. I also have an email through owasp.org. Are you in the code solve Discord server? Discord? I don't. Yes. Have you seen the Oh, that's right. Yeah, if you see like a oh. picture of a calico cat. That's Korean. that's me. Oh, I didn't think that yeah, that's my cat. <laughs> so, can can we take a look at the top ten real quick? Can I go through them real quick? Yes, I don't have them like on the slide deck, but uh, we we had opened it up while we were waiting. Yeah, on. yeah. We 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 started to get curious, so yeah. This is their top 10, uh, top 10 web application security risks. Um, this is the... How come your favorite's not there? <laughs> Which one? My favorite. Oh, because uh, it's like... Mm, I would say this one is... Uh, <laughs> yes, this is probably like... Okay. Yes. That makes sense with supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is um the top ten for web application security. Um the I guess they update the this, this list every few years because the last time I checked this list was um well actually the first time that I learned about this list was twenty seventeen. And as you can see, um the top ten um it includes broken access control. Um, which usually means um, there's something like broken in the authentication of an app. Or what? Can you give an example? Of, are you aware of any, uh, what was broken or what was it impact or anything? Uh, I, not often, not on the top of my head. This is a question. Um, I'm guessing broken access control. I'm not 100% sure if this is what it is, but would this be a broken access Um, yes, I, I would believe that would con be counted as broken access control. Yeah, you each gave us a story while before you came, I don't know, it sounds like it might be the same thing, where his school was just using um, like generated passwords based on people's names and publicly available information. So I guess if 
the passwords are system generated and so forth. Um, maybe. Perhaps. That sounds like a fun time, though. Yeah. I mean, not if you're like an average person, but if you're like a threat actor, you know. So some of the other, um, some others on this list are cryptographic failures, which is really interesting to me. Um, injection. Uh, insecure design. So any of these that you've actually come across in your work? Um, I want to say this one, using vulnerable and outdated components. Um, yeah, I would say like if you have, if you are, if you're working with a code base and I think most corporations have code bases that have different components, like third-party software libraries. Um, if a third-party software library is, like, if it's, um, if it has, like, a zero day or it's not patched, um, there's that li liability that it can be open to bad actors. And then... This is also um, one of the resources that I was talking about, um, CV. Um, it's basically, um, it's a really good resources, resource, not resources, but for finding vulnerabilities. And their Twitter feed is actually really good for uh, just keeping track, but Yeah, I just I just think this stuff is cool. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm wondering where you spent the most of your time at work. Are you working at a company and and you like just go over all the codes or and then check whether there is some uh, vulnerabilities or do you, do you have any certain things that you have to do or yeah, so um, when it comes to application security, when working in like a corporate environment, usually uh, the way that I try to approach um, application security is that I, I think it's fundamentally like a people issue. I don't want to mean like people are in the wrong ones, but like, I think that security, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And um, so I did a lot of focusing on like security awareness and just hosting like security like happy hours not like happy hours but like security chats where anyone could ask anything without um you know without you know, anything security related and they they could ask that and we would i would answer it for them and um so the second part of the question of your question um how did i implement security uh, it involves um, talking to a lot of different teams to make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, so not just like uh, engineering and QA, but also like product teams. It's you're really trying to instill like security at the start of the software development life cycle. So you have to talk to all of the teams involved. And one of the um, the things that I find most fun is actually doing like testing, security testing. Um, you can either do manual testing or um, automated testing. With uh, manual testing, you are usually um, using a WASP zap or uh, burp suite to do pen testing. Um, but there's also other tools like DAST and SAST tools that you can use to find uh, vulnerabilities in um, code. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Could, could you repeat the tools that you used again? I, I know about OWASP Zap. Uh, OWASP Zap and then uh, Burp Suite. It's another pen testing tool. 
and then there's like a bunch of others um uh like what do i call them i they're like vendors who sell security tools but um those are all like sast uh, which is uh, I want to say static analysis, um, security testing, there's DAS, um, dynamic analysis, security testing. What are the differences between those two? Um, static, I believe, is that you're just testing like the code as is, and then um, DAS, if I recall correctly, um, you're testing it like in a production environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the static laundry is just like scanning the source code? Yes. Looking for vulnerabilities and like looking at the packages you're using? Yes. And then like laundry, like <laughs> going to your production running site and like trying to do stuff there? Yes. So the thing about that is that you don't actually want to run these tools like in an actual production environment because you don't want to like break something and knock something offline so usually you do it in like in a test environment and like not test but like staging environment so mm -hmm. some are you yeah. okay something set up similar to the production environment but not the production environment. yes before it goes live yes mm -hmm. i'm just about done if you have any questions oh i have a bunch <laughs> <laughs> okay. i don't mean to scare you um and I apologize if people ask things already. So like, in, in your work as, as an AppSec uh, person, like do you, do you just kind of regularly use penetration testing tools against your software? Or like, what's, what is the day in the life kind of like? So I want to say it very, it very much varies on the company that you work for. If you're working for a startup, as I have done so in the past, um, they, it, there was probably very limited budget for security tools. So stuff like Burp Suite um, is, that's what you get. Uh, what? Oh, I didn't hear what you said. Stuff like Burp Suite is like, that's like pretty much, it's pretty standard for security testing. Um, but more often than not, like the other tools that are used for security testing can be cost expensive is for, um, a startup, mm. especially in today's climate. So what does Burpsy do? Um, I can Google it if you would like me to. Right. You've used it before, right? Yes. Okay. Like, what's your opinion of it? Um, like, how is it different from the others you recommended? That kind of thing. Um, the thing about Burp Suite is that uh, it has a community version and a professional version, and the professional version uses a license. And there's a lot of resources for it, and but there's also a lot of resources for OWASP Zap. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. They do the same thing. Um, they do just about the same thing, but I, I think I find Burp Suite a little bit more intuitive to use than OWASP Zap. Okay. And the community version, what's missing, or what is it? Are the limits on it? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. For, let's say I'm an engineer, and say we're like working together, right? And I'm like, I don't know shit about security, what should I do? Like, what would you recommend to software engineers who want to be security minded, but maybe aren't yet? Yeah, I think my initial, my initial reaction is to go point them to a WASP top 10. But if I just do that, they're not really going to understand. Mm. Because it's, it's just a list, but um, I think something that could really make an impact is to actually show them examples of what like a WASP top 10 looks like in code mm -hmm. and provide it with like real whole world examples through like the CVE okay. list. Okay. What? Okay. Yeah, and um, you know, I'm sure past examples of um, how this vulnerability costed the company like X amount of millions of dollars. Yeah, so. I think that's um, a more effective approach than just telling in engineering to look at a wasp top 10. So what's, uh, what's kind of a common thing that you've found, or what's, so like we have these different categories of vulnerabilities, 
right? And you know, engineers have different habits, different practices. Like in your work, what was something that you saw kind of commonly, and you had to like keep telling people like, hey, don't do this, hey, don't do that, kind of stuff. I want to say um, hard coded credentials. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously not something. It's a thing that happens, especially if you work for like a big company, but it does happen. And I think there's like, when you look at the average computer science uh, curriculum um, in the United States, they don't really teach like application security. They might teach like computer security as an elective, but it's more focused on network security than it is, you know, application security. I would say that checking logs, that's more of a, a security operations thing than it is for application security. Um, application security is kind of like a niche and um, I want to say like checking logs, that is like something usually a security engineer or someone who works in a security operations role does. Um, I've done both, so. So with something like um, hard-coded credentials, um, how do you detect that or do you just scan through source code looking for it or um, do you kind of caught it or how, how does the asset team or do you just educate people like, hey, don't do this thing? It's normally like an education thing. Okay. Um, I think um, almost every company that I've worked at, they have had some form of security awareness training, but that is usually more often than not. It's your security awareness training is like a bunch of videos that you pretend to watch and. <laughs> yes. Really bad security awareness training where they would send you emails, like really sus suspicious looking emails that would require you to go and like sign up and go take some tests or something. And I, I kept telling them, like, hey, normally I would ignore this kind of email. <laughs> 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 like you're forcing me to, you know. <laughs> mm. one, one company I worked at, they were like super security crazy. But they were like a video game company. So like, what? Oh, okay. But they um they have their security team print out these little flyers of like you know the top ten bad practices for engineers, and then they just put them on everyone's desk, like everyone in the company. Be like, don't do this, don't do that. Look out for this. If you have a question about this, email us at this email. Hmm. And like, they, it wouldn't be like oh they put it on the edge of the desk. They like put it like. You know how with your monitor you have like the screen part and then you have the border? They like put it like on the border so it was blocking your screen so you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. They were like super aggressive. But you know, the thing with that approach is that they're trying to prioritize the security, but in my opinion, um, that it becomes co more of a roadblock. Mm -hmm. And like s engineers, they're more likely to like just take that piece of paper and like throw it in the trash. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Especially with that approach. What's like a really good question that you got during your happy hour training sessions from engineers? That's a good question. I would have to think about that. Um, I think just like some of the more basic stuff, I actually really like answering because even though it's like noob level stuff, it just, there's people who aren't aware 
of you know basic security practices I will say that um, in the past uh, one of the things I did and this was like pre pandemic so 2019 um, was host uh, we did like a series of like security awareness workshops and one of them was to um, uh, host lock picking Wait, host lockpicking? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like lock, lockpicking. Oh, no, we were like, yeah, hosting lockpicking oh. sessions around, yeah, in the office. And we, it was fun. People came and went and we taught them how to pick locks. Uh, can you pick locks? <laughs> yes. I, I don't think I brought my lockpicking set with me, though. I might have mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wait, are you talking like, like, like cybersecurity lockpicking? <laughs> no, like physical lockpicking. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Because, yeah. I think I think I think cybersecurity lock picking is called hacking. Yeah, so I, I thought you were using some new vocabulary. Like, okay, I'm rolling. With that. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Hmm. So like, I don't get to talk to a lot of security people, especially in Korea. So like. Oh, hey. Hi, you missed my entire talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, in terms of education, what have you found? Or, like, oh, you mentioned like the happy hour thing. Was that an effective? Was that your most effective method? Or would you, if you were to do it again, would you do something different? Yeah, the thing about that happy hour, it was it was working for like a, a remote company so we were all remote so you, you really missed out on that like in-person interaction mm. but it, it, did it seem like it was effective did people become more security conscious or or not sure uh, i'm not sure okay. um you know actually i think mm -hmm. security cyber security it's you have to like really work with the people and I, I think more often than, than not, cybersecurity can be viewed as a roadblock, especially for uh, like product and engineering teams who are under pressure to push out or ship out a, prod, um, a product as you know fast as possible. Yeah, I've seen that. So I've seen, um, I was working at a company and they were using some tool of scanning and like reporting vulnerabilities and a lot of them when we looked into it like wasn't really an issue or it didn't apply to us like maybe there's some javascript vulnerability but it's in like our client side javascript which is all untrusted anyway and we don't care if people are like, going to hack their own browser mm -hmm. <laughs> so things like that but, but because it got reported in the tool like you have to go fix it and waste time you know, I think there's sort of like a fundamental mismatch between engineering teams and security teams because um, cybersecurity, uh, if if it's even taught in school, it focuses primarily on um, network security. And I think security people, if they see something, they're like, hey, you got to fix this. doesn't matter like what the severity is. They just want to see it fixed. But and they don't understand enough of like the engineering side to understand. The real irony, frustrating thing is that the engineers were aware of actual vulnerabilities <laughs> that were way more important than that. Mm. But yeah, no, no one asked them like, "What do you think is the biggest security hole?" Or <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. I think I I will say in past rules, uh, managing a bug bounty program, um, anything that's like pretty much not uh, not rated as a critical or high vulnerability will just get ignored. Or put into the backlog, also known as like, Have you run bug bounty programs before? Yes, I have. I have managed a bug bounty program with um, Hacker One, um, also mm -hmm. known as Hackeroni. Mm -hmm. uh, did Did you start the program, or you? Uh, I inherited from mm -hmm. some. How? Uh, what was that like? like? Was it difficult? Did you have to like prove your worth a lot? Was it difficult working with the penetration testers? 
So um, for uh, the bug banding program that I managed specifically, we I, I guess we paid extra for them to have like a triage team, so like Hacker One triage. Mm -hmm. So we would get a report, and the Hacker One triage team would uh, they would tri triage it for us um, to say what the uh, severity was and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then so all of that was left on our end was to just. You know, take a look at the vul uh, vulnerability that w was reported. Um, um, contact our engineering teams and then pay it out. Mm -hmm. Do you remember like how much total you paid for the bug bounty program uh, versus the value? Like, what what did they find? Um, I will say that some of our like I think for criticals, uh, anything critical was three thousand um, dollars. High severity was um, a thousand and yeah. Is that categoriz categorization was determined by by your side. Uh, it was determined by the CVSS score of the vulnerability. Okay. Oh, so they would basically look at the CVE library and then basically try to test your application against the CVE library, or? Um, no, the CVSS. Uh, it's um a, a way to score a vulnerability, oh, and so it's, it's a standard score. yes, oh. this, yes, and you might think that three thousand dollars is a lot to pay for um it, it's a lot to pay out for a, a bug bounty, but um I think it's really a drop in the bucket when you consider like companies losing, not losing, but like um getting ransomware and then having to pay out like billions in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know Recently, there was one issue in Linux, Linux kernel 6. There was an issue in which a uh, person can remotely exclude some code in one of your, in your machine using some library, but that was not actually given a CVS code. I read about it and they gave some big reason for that. I didn't understand that thing. So, like, is there any, any like precondition for adding a vulnerability to CVS or not add, giving a CVS code for those? Like they are similar to which 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 don't, don't have any CVS code that is removed from that list. So how that happened, I don't understand that. Like, do you have any idea about those? Which kind of vulnerabilities are not categorized under CVS and just left out? Uh, I am not entirely sure. I, I think in the past of like me managing bug bounty programs, there have been stuff that uh hasn't been rated by the triage team but it was it still ended up being like a critical vulnerability and uh it, it was stuff like it, that had nothing to do with actual computer code or computer software but more uh, more things to do with like um i want to say like stuff that um, pertains to like devops tools When calculating that CVSS, like so, so it's so it's a like semi-objective system, right? Like code execution or you know access, you know all these different kind of flags. Is so when you log a CVE, is like can you not log it without a CVSS being applied, or does someone have to like go and apply it? So when you um, you actually have to apply. Uh, or report um, a vulnerability that, that you found right. for it to be in the database. And um, I'm not entirely sure. I think um, I'm not sure what the process is for it to go, for it to be rated. Yeah. 
I do know that in, in America, um, I think there's like certain legislation uh, where you have to report uh, a security breach or else you get fined a lot of money. In South Korea, that doesn't really seem to be a thing here. I heard they still use um, Internet Explorer here. They, they're fixing oh. it. They're fixing it. Oh, so like you mean I can't go and play my Flash games? <laughs> <laughs> not, not only do they just use it, but I, if I remember correctly, they sometimes they require it. Like my bank, you have to use Windows and IE if you want to do online banking. And then you have to install some dealers and all, and they use it for security. Yeah. And that always there is always leakage. Uh, like, okay, sadly, last week, my credit card was used in France for 300 oh. and USB for something. Oh. <laughs> and I personally being software engineer as well as some cyber security person, I know that it was nowhere from where I can give the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But it's for sure when they use the dealers and all, I know there are some bugs in those DLS of some companies mm -hmm. which they use, mm -hmm. but I know because I'm the user, but the same way other people can also know. Mm -hmm. So I always think that my credit card number and security code is somewhere there online of Korean. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it is there. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's my limit. Mm -hmm. I think it's a limit. Okay, how much the person can take this much? Mm -hmm. I'll come there. <laughs> yeah. It have happened with me like this last Monday, Tuesday around. And then the company says, so oh, we will talk to Visa, they gave us the authorization code and all those things. They don't do anything. Mm -hmm. There are some issues. Like right now I work in Samsung, they had some security things for work from home system. We broke it. Then they fixed it. Something new, we again broke it. <laughs> they again fixed it, we again broke it. <laughs> now still broken. They don't fix it after that because they can't fix it the DLS. They have to change the system itself. So that's how they leak all the designs of phones. Mm. Anyone can leak, and they can't catch the person. Mm. So they have those issues right now. I think, um, I think I I was actually talking to someone recently who knows more about like um, South Korea tech than I do, and they basically said that after like a certain year. South Korea just basically stopped innovating, and I'm not sure if that's true or not. I don't mean to say, I want to, I don't want to mean like innovating, but like they just stopped and s just yeah. stopped using modern tech. So Korea is really good at optimizing. Like they figure out the one thing that they're going to do, and they go super hard on that yeah, thing. But they just leave everything else yeah. gone. Yeah. Like they want the speed, 5G here, you see the speed. It's super fast. Mm -hmm. We are developing it, I know. I know the loopholes. Anyone can just work up the file system or stand for mm -hmm. It's like they want speed more and they trust people. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have like 5G and really advanced um, AI machine learning stuff, but um, still used Internet Explorer. Yeah. Because yeah. it's all like figure out the one thing to optimize for and screw everything else. Like they have no support for Linux. Now they are starting some support for Mac OS at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Linux, I use Ubuntu or Kali. I I have to install a VM and then everything inside there will work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. If you also use the chart of your Mac client. Yeah. 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 I'm glad they support Mac. Yeah. I support it's a Mac. Big improvement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I I am developer. I want Linux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to, I used to use um, yeah, um, Linux as well, but like yeah, that I have to do the same thing. Use yeah, both people, both so yeah. like. My, my company, we recently did a big security refresh, and we're using like the DLP digital loss prevention software, but we're using a Korean DLP software. And like we had a whole bunch of researchers and engineers who were going to switch to Linux, but the DLP doesn't work for Linux. Yeah. So now like, it fucked. <laughs> if you get a government from Korean government, a document, it's in HWP format. Hangul word processing format. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. As movie viewers are, there are very, very few free yeah. as movie viewers. They, well, they, do, they do provide a free viewer though. Yeah, only one or two they provide. The government one, you have to install something in the system, then it will work. Yeah, true. So you can't have normal viewer you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Although it's one or two K per month, current people pay. <laughs> but I think like for a government document, I have to pay for viewing it if I want to view it without any deals and all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's mm -hmm. 
working. So because people are good here and people trust each other, it's working. Mm. If it would be like somewhere Russia, India, China, US, it would be like <laughs> everyone else fighting on cyber security of each other. Yeah. You cheated on me, your account gone. Mm. So for So I, I, I know you, you've had three years experience, which is a good amount, not, not huge, but like what? It's enough to not be considered that like entry level, you know? Yes. So, but, but with the knowledge you do have, like at what level would you say that a company needs a dedicated security person? Would it be based on like the number of employees, number of users? Like how would you figure that out? Hmm. In your opinion, I know it's yeah, not an absolute thing. Um, I want to say for like super early stage startups, it's probably not a big deal because uh, your startup is gonna fail anyways. It's <laughs> 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 funny. <laughs> but like, if if like, let's say you're assuming the company is doing well, like, would you would you base it on like? Number of employees, number of engineers, number of users. Um, I would actually go by um, other metrics like um, how well the company is doing um, financially and the, if they're growing. Because if they were growing, um, that means. Um, well, not only that, but uh, I think when you, uh, for at least for um, United States, uh, you're if you want to go like public at an IPO, you need like um, certain standards. Um, you need to have like audits done and all of that. And to have an audit, you need a security, at least a, you need at least um, a CISO or a security team. Can get me a job at like Samsung? Uh, I can do referral. <laughs> I mean, you can get me a referral, right? What's the interview process like? If I can do a referral and then you have a LinkedIn, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. It, it, like you have to go search on LinkedIn because Samsung checks LinkedIn for an mm-hmm. employee. If that looks good, too good, they then HR contacts you for that thing. I can do a referral and then they contact you. I can give referral to everyone because if you give referral, you get some money if the person is <laughs> hired. <laughs> I have nothing to lose. But you were telling us that you are going to get out of some fun. So before I get out, please, everyone join me. <laughs> <laughs> get that referral money and then leave. Yeah. <laughs> What was your question? Sorry. So, what was a good way to figure out the specific website? Is, is it a um, uh, scam website or is it uh, a uh, normal website? Um, I've really liked using um, Virus Total in the past. Um, I think it's a. Uh, can I go ahead and Google it? Yeah. You're in charge. You don't have to ask me for anything. Uh, so this is virus total. Um, basically, it's uh, it's analyzes anything that you want, or any file, any URL, or you can search for some stuff, and it comes back with um, 
if that URL is bad or not. Um, <laughs> not off the top of my head, but if um, I'm open to suggestions. Okay, Beej, you, you gotta know some, some sketchy sites. If you want to do S3 injections, they're not them. Yeah, I wonder if Pirate Bay is still running. Um, yeah, but I don't know if that would trip us off. Alta, AltaVista. Where my mom tried to book tickets. Expedia? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah. There's a lot of scam uh, airline booking sites. There's right. a bunch of them. Um, you go to Instagram, you will find something. <laughs> you go to what? You go to Instagram, you will find uh, something. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have an experience when I went off on a business trip, like last, last, last year. Uh, and then I, I had to book like an e-stop. And then there was oh, another yeah. website that looked really looked official, but except they charged like one hundred dollars or something like that for e stuff. Yeah. And then when it's only like ten or twenty dollars or something like that, I can't remember the exact price. Mm. And then I booked it through that. So they t they they redirect to the original e star like program mm. and they like just do the transaction for twenty dollars and then they just pocket the remaining eighty dollars. <laughs> that <laughs> many and I, I felt for that. High school. <laughs> What? Visa, visa site. Yeah. So I'm in India, so I have to get visa for visa. So I think um, something uh, for a future talk that would be interesting to do is on um, how to t determine if um, a website is malicious or not, and you know, threat hunting uh, techniques. Mm. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah, and also, um, there's this thing called. Um, like email spoofing that I think is just fascinating. Like p attack, like um, bad actors can use spoofed emails to pretend to be someone else, but they're not. And I get them all the time in my spam e email, <laughs> my, my spam folder. So actually I use this website for checking the, the, the file that I downloaded. So it's kind of utility file. But it, it was uh, really good. It checked uh, very well. But what's the mechanism for this? I mean, when, uh, when I unload a specific file, it checks all maybe a virus or the maybe reputation or something like that. But what, what, how, what is the mechanism behind uh, this website? Of uh, a virus tool? Or? Yeah, virus tool. If you uh, check this one maybe any maybe utility file, it checks or maybe possible maybe virus or adware and some maybe score, reputation. So that uh, it, 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 was it was very interesting. Is it possible that API endpoints and like runs analysis, some sort of analysis on all the endpoints? Maybe, we, the check, maybe we can analyze the assembly code and then check if it there's some, there some malicious jump statements that call in the assembly code. That what? means there's been something behind there which are going to blow the stack and all. If you can, like, if you can read assembly code, you can check that thing. At least, like, if it's malware or deleting some files and all those things, you can check those things for sure. Right? I, I don't know much about this. So like, this might be a really dumb question, but, like, you can, I'm pretty sure that using this, you cannot access back end content. So, you'll have to entirely rely on front end. Right? Yeah. 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 So, so, I have a request. So, there's this uh, popular kind of hiring workflow management website called Workable. Um, can we try plugging that one in there and see what kind of what kind of results it gives us? Work uh, work and then able uh, Just uh, singular, singular. Oh, so A B L E. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a typo. 
also unrelated, but I really like how your keyboard has the um, the four most important keyboards like bolded. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, not the keys. That's why you gave me the keyboard. Oh, also oh, it checks for the keyboard. Yeah, it does. Oh, the vendors check it. Yeah. And it's, uh, I guess, like, virus total is just an aggregate of all of the... Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, details. Can we look at the details? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so it's just HTTP stuff. Uh, for a web app, I would say no, because this, this is like really just testing um, the website to uh, make sure that it's not associated with like any um, uh, malicious factors like like Russia. I don't know. Um, I, I would say it's for it to do like pr proper security testing on a web application. Uh, usually requires um, some sort of penetration testing tools. And a virus, a total, it's more of a, like a threat intelligence, uh, threat hunting kind of tool. Uh, pen tri uh, for like application security testing, you want to use like a, a WASP um, zap or a burp sweep, or um, you either that or you want to use like um, automated security testing tools, which more often than not are um, sold by vendors and not really something you can access on the in individual level. Yes. Yeah, in my experience, um, I think that uh, application security, it, w it would be best done if you um, actually treat like engineers like people and not just tell them, hey, th here is this bug, you need to fix it, and just leave it at that, you know? <laughs> so, question. If, if, let's say I'm a DevOps engineer, and let's say I'm security minded, so I guess that's like ops or whatever. Um, <coughs> I haven't used I haven't used Bird Suite or OWASP Zap directly. I just know they exist and what they do. But how effective or not effective, how useful would it be to like if I set up some kind of cron job to every month or so basically run Burp Suite or whatever against my website and then kind of like share the report in, in Slack or something, is uh, would that work, do you think? I mean not not in the human aspect. Just in terms of I think uh, so. A wasp zap. Um, they has um, a tool that it has a mode where you can like just like spider and crawl through the web. But the thing about that is that you don't get very like critical vulnerabilities. You get like most like, yeah yeah. You didn't really get anything that's like truly looking into and yeah. and to actually um do the, you know, uh, get some of, of the, I guess, the juicy stuff. You either need to be running, like, automated scripts on top of Burp Suite, or you actually need to be using it to randomly test for things. So the thing that you're thinking of is not called penetration testing. I would, um, there's tools um, that you can, uh, there's a vendor tools, usually um, like SAST and DAST, you know, s security testing that uh, you can integrate into your pipeline. Mm -hmm. I think that
I think true. I think automation um, would be. I think it, it's a good thing, and I think really security needs to do its best not to be like a roadblock to engineering. So we, so my team, we, as part of working with a medical partner, we had to do a whole bunch of security stuff, and they're like, you need to scan your Docker images. I'm like, well, shit, okay, how do we do that? So we found this tool, Trivi, we put it as part of our CI pipeline, and now we just have it sending to Slack, and no one looks at it. <laughs> So you say you have to do right. You don't take what you need. Right. So what we're gonna, what I'm thinking, we're gonna do is instead like, um, so so you have to kind of figure out what each team is good at, right? So like our team, our project management is pretty good. Like when stuff goes in the backlog, we actually review it and then prioritize it, and we usually prioritize security pretty highly. So like, what we might end up doing, to your point, Jay, is like have a security scanning tool as part of our CI, and then rather than like send like, oh no, look at this, but like it's not prioritized, so it's not prioritized, no one can look at it. But I think if we can automatically create like a Jira issue, oh, automatically cool. mark it as high priority, move, put it at the top of the backlog, oh, and then like the, the project manager has to see it, like it would be easy. Oh, that's a good But yeah, we may try that. That sounds great. I, I remember from one of my jobs, um, I, um, in a way, I kind of like automated one of my tasks, um, so that um, I set up like a Slack alert, so that um, that would uh, message me whenever um, I had something to look at in um, the scene that we used. And this was back when I was doing like security operations. So whenever something came in, um, maybe it was like once every 15 minutes or like once every two hours. Um, yeah. That's pretty good. So you kind of built your backlog or your work team. Yeah. And um, if I had nothing else to do like work-wise, technically I can just play video games every day. <laughs> <laughs> so were you part of like a SOC, like a security operations center, or was it something different? Um, I, my first role in security, like my, my first full-time job outside of an internship, I was um, working in a security team that, uh, in my role, so when you're starting on cybersecurity, um, you're primarily probably working in the SOC, and you're doing like um, cyber, uh, you're doing cybersecurity, but it's kind of boring, you're doing like the grunt work of cybersecurity, which is basically you're looking at alerts, and then you're triaging them to see if they're like, True positive or a false positive? Mm -hmm. What kind of tools do you use? Like, what is tools like that? Tools things or something? Uh, like, operation testing? Um, I I did not. I, I, I think the role of a security operations analyst is not to do any testing. Uh, that's more of a like a red team thing, which is it's a cybersecurity has like it's an umbrella of different roles. And when you're working in like um, when you're doing security operations, you're either doing a threat hunting, working um, in a SOC, or you're doing um, like incident response. Other questions before we start wrapping up? I was thinking maybe it's possible we can have a session for not like doing. Exploiting some maybe some known, not so basic kind of known threats and all using multiple something and then that's fun, right? Yeah. I, I always have Kali in my system for last eight years. So uh, it is good if possible that like, since you are working on that already you have experience, we can have a session like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely do um a workshop on um hacking. <laughs> Or even you can find something like some contest and we can relatively try to exploit that. Maybe we can play capture the flag game. Yeah, yeah. Play that. Yeah. And any other questions? Well, thank you.
you everyone for coming. Um, uh, the official event is over, but usually afterwards we go grab food. Um, so uh, we have a lot of people though. Yeah, uh, and we can try it anyway. Uh, so normally we go out for food afterwards. We usually go get chicken. Uh, is anyone not able to eat chicken? Okay. Cool. So if you guys want to join, uh, we're gonna head to a chicken place. Hopefully they have enough room for all of us, but we'll try. Um, but other than that, thank you again, Caitlin, for uh, running things. And um, uh, again, make sure to check us out on um, on Meetup for future events and. If you want to join our chat where you can ask questions or even continue this conversation, you can join our Discord. Link is up there. Or if you prefer to scan it with your phone, here's a QR code. Um, and okay, it's OK if I share these slides with the Discord, yes? That's fine. Cool. So we'll share these slides. Uh, we'll also share the recording. Um, I don't think we actually need to do any editing. I think that was pretty good. So Yeah, so I'll share the recording uh, as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Where is?